Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Uh, today in this video lecture, uh, I'll be discussing the famous play by Henrik Ibsen, Adolf's House. And uh, today in this video, we shall look at the first act of the play. As far as the characters are concerned, let me first introduce you to the characters. Uh, there is Torvald Helmer, who is a lawyer. Nora Helmer, his wife, then Kristin Linde, who is uh, Nora's uh, friend, then Nils Krogstad, who is also, uh, who you also used to work at the bank, but then he got, you know, associated with some scandalous work which affected his reputation in society. Then they have the, uh, they have the nursemaid called Annie Mary. Then there is another maid in the play who is Helen. And then we have Helmer's uh, three children. As the uh, play opens, we find that the action takes place in the Helmer's flat. It's a pleasant room and there is a porter standing outside. And uh, it is, and uh, there is, and the porter, you know, uh, he is carrying a Christmas tree and a basket in his hand. He hands them to the maid who has opened the door for them. As uh, Act 1 of the play opens, we find that uh, Nora, she is uh, making all the preparations for Christmas and uh, as she enters, she is addressed as Skylark and then she is also addressed as Little Squirrel, you know, playing about like her, by her uh, husband. Uh, Torvald Helmer and this uh, immediately you know tells us in the big in the very beginning of the play that how uh, Torvald fails to treat uh, Nora seriously as an individual and the way he addresses her as squirrel as a skylark it shows that she's being deprived of her you know identity as an uh, individual and then we find that Nora uh, is considered you know a spendthrift woman who squanders about or who spends money uh, thoughtlessly so this is actually uh, Helmer's opinion or let's say Helmer's impression about uh, Nora and uh, he thinks, Torvald thinks that Nora, whenever he gives money to Nora, what she does, she always spends those money on useless things. And later on, she comes back to Torvald to get more and more. And there, Nora is of, in here we find that Nora is of the opinion that they can, you know, be, uh, spend a little more since uh, Torvald is going to get promoted at the bank. But then uh, Helmer makes it clear that it would be, you know, it's only after the new year and it would be three whole months before the first paycheck comes in. And as far as borrowing money is concerned, we find both Torvald and Nora differing in their opinions. And Helmer says that Nora always has these frivolous ideas. This is actually uh, Helmer's, uh, you know, uh, opinion uh, about women, where he says that Nora, when she asks, when she says that it's better that they can borrow money anytime, he says that she's simply behaving uh, like a typical uh, woman because it is, it is like one should not have the foundation of their house, you know, uh, as uh, one shouldn't have borrowed money okay as the foundation of their house because it is something inhibited and something very very uh, unpleasant and then uh, nora is again given money by uh, torvald where we find that nora displays all the things that she has bought for her children but the thing is one thing is to be noted here that nora has bought nothing for herself okay and here in here we find that Nora is very happy, you know, uh, to perform the role of a wife, to perform the role of a mother. And even the toys that she has bought for her children, it shows like her consciousness about the uh, traditional gender roles. So uh, she says that, uh, I have bought a little sword for Ivar. There is a horse and a trumpet for Bob and a doll for Amy. So here we can see that how, you know, even the toys are, uh, the toys seem to be uh, segregated for children belonging to different genders. 
and then Helmar asks Nora if she would like to buy something for herself and Nora we find that she's not much interested in buying uh, anything for herself but she tells Helmar that every time uh, Helmer can uh, give her lots and lots of money. So as the play begins, now the readers uh, may have the impression or it is quite natural for readers, you know, to form this impression about uh, uh, Nora that she is a woman who is after money. But as the play proceeds, we shall understand that although she is labeled as a spendthrift woman by Torvald, Okay, and although she is accused of not being able to save money at all, yet we shall find that Nora is not that insensible a woman as she is made out to be by uh, Torvald. So, uh, uh, then he uh, simply, again we find uh, Helmer addressing her as uh, my pretty little pet is very sweet but it runs away with an awful lot of money it's incredible how expensive it is for a man to give such a pet this is really offensive Nora is Torvald's life partner his wife but here we find Torvald looking upon her as a very expensive pet to be maintained by her husband and then he says that, and when Nora defends herself saying that, no, uh, I save everything I can. So Helmer says that, no, you are right there. Yes, you are true that you save everything you can. But the problem is you simply cannot, which means that you are never able to save money. And uh, this is another comment or uh, another uh, remark made by uh, Helmer is also very offensive because he simply traces, you know, uh, Nora's uh, being a spendthrift woman. Uh, he traces it that uh, saying that she has simply, you know, uh, inherited this threat uh, from her father. So he says that just like your father, you are always looking for money. Okay, and wherever you can, you can you simply lay your hands on it. Okay, but as soon as you have got it, it just seems to slip through your fingers. So here, like all these, uh, you know, remarks made by Torvald uh, tell readers the kind of impression that he has about uh, Nora. Actually, uh, what uh, Torvald Helmer looks for is complete allegiance or let's say complete obedience from Nora as his uh, wife okay and then we find that uh, Nora has you know uh, ha is Nora is fond of uh, eating macarons okay but here we find that Nora's sworn obedience that she she always you know tries to appease or she tries she always tries to please her husband but behind his back she eats Macarons. So we can say that her sworn obedience is just, you know, a kind of lie or a pretense. And so Nora says here, when she's asked that whether she went to the market, so whether she had eaten macarons or not. So she says, uh, I would never dream of doing anything you did not want to. But as readers, we understand that we know that it is not uh, true. Uh, Ibsen here we find that uh, he uses you know the techniques of uh, reputation because the need for money uh, is repeated everywhere throughout uh, uh, this act and <coughs> each character's dialogue okay whether it's Helma's dialogue or Nora's dialogue we find that it is punctuated with uh, money. So uh, here Helmer says that Nora you can't imagine how I am looking forward to this evening because it's going to be Christmas time but herein lies the dramatic you know irony because this evening is actually uh, not going to be a pleasant one for them and Nora says that even she is looking for this looking forward to uh, you know to enjoying this uh, evening. And then uh, Helmer uh, reminds her of the, you know, last Christmas because three whole weeks what she did actually, uh, Nora simply shut herself every evening. She locked herself in her room till after midnight and she used to make flowers because they didn't have enough money uh, to decorate the Christmas tree. So what she used to do, Helmer reminds her that she used to uh, 
make uh, flowers for decorating the Christmas tree and all the other beautiful things that she wanted to surprise them with. And this again underlines uh, Nora's uh, concern for the family as well as the financial problems that they had been undergoing. Ugh, I never felt so bored in all my life. Helmer says that because Nora uh, kept herself locked in her room. She was busy making flowers. And then Nora says, I wasn't the least bit bored. Board. Now here we can see the difference between the two. While Nora was busy in you know in preparing things which would make her family members, her husband, her children happy, while instead of appreciating or you know uh, saying that instead of waiting eagerly, okay. So uh, Helmer says that uh, he simply felt a uh, bored. And but still we find that uh, Helmer says that yeah yes I know poor little Nora. Uh, I know what you actually wanted. You wanted for us to have a nice time so that we could have a nice time. Okay. And it is the thought behind it that counts. So here, uh, Helmer appears to be sensible because we find that he appreciates Nora's hard work. And then we find that uh, another important character uh, appears in the play, who is uh, Mrs. Uh, Linde. Uh, she appears and uh, Mrs. Linde is now at present, she is a widow and she actually had to sacrifice her love life or she had to sacrifice her love for the sake of her sick mother and two younger brothers in order to gain financial stability in society because during the Victorian period uh, it is it, it must be noted that uh, during the Victorian period uh, women were not allowed to participate in the public sphere okay there was a complete segregation okay the public domain was meant for men while the private domain was meant for women women were only supposed to you know to, to take care of their family their husband their children so as uh, mrs lynn christine linde appears we find that uh, nora you know still uh, despite knowing her condition she appears to be uh, you know it shows uh, it reflects nora's carefree innocence and at the same time at, at her uh, insensitiveness to some extent because she continues to speak about their own well-being she continues to uh, speak about um, Helmer's, you know, promotion. Okay. And uh, at the same time, we find that Nora says something very important. And uh, she says that actually they are meeting each other, Christine and Nora, they are meet, meeting each other after eight years. And she is really surprised to find that, uh, you know, that Christine has come all the way alone, you know, to meet her. So she says that that took courage, all that long journey in winter time so uh, actually it is symbol it hints at you know a uh, woman's desire for uh, independence because as i said during that era uh, a victorian period nobody could imagine you know uh, that a woman would desire for uh, independence and then mrs linda says that she just arrived this morning on the steamer to then nora says that uh, you know how lovely that uh, she's happy that Christine has come because now they are going to have huge fun. They are going to have much fun on Christmas. But this is again ironically. Okay, this is dramatic irony because there is, uh, because we shall find that this Christmas is not going to be a pleasant, uh, this Christmas is not going to be a pleasant one uh, for them. And uh, uh, we also find that uh, do take uh, Nora asks uh, Miss Christine Linde to take off her things and you know to settle down to relax, okay? And then uh, Mrs. Linde has deteriorated much in her health, and that is why you know initially uh, Nora is not able to recognize her. <clears throat> and after that, uh, Nora. Uh, it becomes uh, it is made known to the audience that Christine Linde is a widow now and we come to know about her life that her husband died okay when her husband died his business was also uh, not well okay and he left her with nothing not even a penny not even a child 
Okay, so here Christine Linde tells Nora that her husband died three years ago. And when Nora asks that if didn't he leave you anything? So this again underlines that how much a woman is dependent on her husband financially. And Mrs. Linde makes it clear that nothing at all, uh, not even a broken heart to grieve over, which means that hers had been a loveless marriage. Although her husband died, but uh, his death failed to grieve her, uh, to make her, sorry, her, uh, her uh, Death, his death uh, failed to uh, make her feel sad. So uh, we can see that uh, now here a comparison can be made that Nora's happy marriage appears to be a happy one. Okay, there is security, there is happiness. While when we look at Christine's marriage, that is a loveless marriage. That's what it is made clear here. So we can see that uh, during that era, in the Victorian period, women often had to sacrifice their own desires, you know, in order to gain financial security and stability in society. And throughout the play, we find, you know, that money, uh, social respectability and promotion. Okay, these are a few ideas that are emphasized, you know, uh, throughout the uh, play and then uh, as I said that Nora appears to be a bit insensitive here because despite knowing uh, Christine's condition she keeps on talking about their great stroke of luck she keeps on talking about their own being that they're going to have you know lots and lots of uh, money and then uh, she also informs her lady Christine that uh, Crocs uh, that uh, Helmer is going to you know uh, get promoted at the bank after New Year and he's getting a big salary and lots of commission and from now on we will be able to live quite differently it means that they will no longer suffer from any uh, poverty and when Nora says uh, and Mrs. Linde is also happy that uh, Crocs that sorry that uh, Helmer is going to get uh, promoted at the bank so and Nora says yes it is no not just enough we are going to have pots and pots of money so whenever uh, Nora you know she talks about money you will find her saying lots and lots of money pots and pots of money this uh, actually uh, provides her you know a sense of uh, security and uh, then we find that uh, Nora says that yes uh, here a reference is made to uh, that time period in their life in Nora and uh, Torvald's life you know when uh, <clears throat> they went through hard times when they had uh, they, when they didn't have uh, much money and both of them had to work much hard and actually when Nora talks about money you know uh, she derives comfort okay uh, she derives comfort from the very idea of having or of possessing you know much money and then she refers to the kinds of jobs that she, even she had to do that knitting embroidery you know or one or two things and she also uh, refers that during that time uh, Torvald uh, left his work in the min at the ministry when they got married and so there were not any uh, brighter prospects of promotion in this in that department so he left the job at the ministry but then at but then you know to meet the family expenses to meet the requirements Torvald had to uh, work very hard and he worked hard so much that he became seriously uh, sick and his condition became so precarious that the doctor advised that uh, they it was essential for him to go uh, south so this is the reason you know behind uh, Torvald uh, sickness that he simply uh, at that point of time overworked himself and then Mrs. Linde says yes I remember that you spent a whole year in Italy at that point of time and we know that during that time when Torvald felt sick they didn't have much money to afford a vacation for one year in Italy. And Nora says, yes, it was just when uh, my son Ivar was uh, born. So another, uh, you know, uh, unconventional uh, uh, feature that we come across here is that during that time, uh, women, uh, belong, women belonging to the uh, middle class 
were not supposed to work and uh, it was something uh, very rare but still uh, Nora had to uh, do it and she says that yes it was that trip that saved Torvald's uh, life <clears throat> and Nora says that $1200 4,800 crown, that's a lot of money. So she had to spend this huge sum of money in order to uh, cure her husband. And Christine is really surprised that how come she afforded, you know, and from where did she get the money? So Nora says that we got it from daddy, you see. So Nora is actually uh, lying here. And we can see that this is an act of deceit. So, uh, Nora says that, uh, you know, uh, here, uh, do you know, I couldn't even go and look after him. So, this point of time, when Torvald was sick, even Nora's father was on his, he was lying on his deathbed. So, the situation was such that Nora couldn't even go and pay a visit uh, to his uh, father. So, she says that that's the saddest thing. You know, I never saw my father again. That was the saddest thing ever that happened in her life because that has happened to me in all my married life because after that, her father uh, died. And uh, then uh, Mrs. Lindy becomes uh, very, very uh, curious, you know, about the money. And later on, and after this, we find that uh, Mrs. Linde questions that if she has got the money from Dr. Rank or not, because Dr. Rank comes now for a, is, he comes here often to, you know, to check uh, uh, for a medical checkup, for Torvald's uh, medical checkup. And so Nora says that, no, Dr. Rank is our best friend. So he often uh, visits our place for, uh, to have, to, you know, to, to get a regular checkup done for uh, Torvald. And here we can see, you know, Nora's dynamic energy. Why? Uh, she says that, isn't it marvelous, wonderful to be alive, to be happy, Christine? Oh, but I should be ashamed of myself because she feels at the same, she realizes, oh, that she has been talking too much about her happiness, you know, her security, her happy marital uh, life. So actually, she's basically, uh, Nora is not an insensitive woman. She's, he's, she's being, you know, uh, here, uh, impolite but that is very uh, childish and here we again come to know that what made you know, Mrs. Linde you know we come to see the social compulsion on women because she says that at that point of time when uh, Mrs. Linde got married to an unknown man he, my mother was still alive she was bedridden she was sick and helpless and then I had my two young brothers to look after as well I didn't think I would be justified in refusing them. So she had to take care of her family. So for the sake of her family interests, okay, uh, Mrs. Linde had to marry someone. Well, Nora is seen to be completely dependent on Torvald for every little requirement, okay, for every little thing. But when we look at uh, Mrs. Linde, we can see she stands as a sharp contrast. She's courageous, you know, she has the courage to earn on her own because she alone at that point of time, uh, she alone faced the world, okay, and uh, tried to earn her bread and butter. And now uh, Nora says that, uh, and but at but now what happened now after the death of her husband? Now uh, even uh, Christine's mother is no longer there; she has died, and even uh, her two younger brothers they have also become dependent or self-dependent. They have grown up. So now Nora says that it must be a great relief for her. But this is very striking here. That although we Christine Linde is uh, you know depicted or portrayed as an independent, courageous woman who can who can take care of herself, who can be you know self dependent, self sufficient, but there is always a need you know uh, to live for someone, to live for, to have someone in life. Okay, so Mrs. Linde says at, in reply to Nora's uh, statement that it must be a great relief for her now. She says. Nobody to live for anymore. That's why I couldn't stand it any longer being cut off up here, there. So she couldn't be all alone. So that's why now she has come to uh, Nora uh, 
and uh, Mrs. Linde's experience in life, you know, has kind of uh, embittered her and uh, that's what she points out to Nora that Nora, uh, that is the worst thing about people in our position, okay? Uh, they become, we become so bitter. When you struggle much in your life, when you face much hard times in your life, what happens? We tend to become bitter, okay? That bitterness, you know, uh, arises in us. So, one has nobody to work for, yet one has to be on the lookout all the time. So, this is very uh, significant in the sense that uh, Mrs. Linde says that it is very pathetic for someone that for someone that one is working but there is none, you know, uh, to look for or to take care of. And uh, still, you have to be on the lookout, look for someone all the time. And life has to go on. And one starts thinking, you become selfish and you begin to think only of yourself. Okay, and uh, Mrs. Lindy says that, you know, here uh, we find that as far as uh, Christine Linde is concerned, even she feels the same, that Nora in her life, she has never faced any struggle, she has uh, never faced any hardship in her life. Okay, and so uh, she says that... Uh, it is very kind of you, Nora, offering to do all this for me because uh, she says that maybe uh, Torvald uh, might help her in some way since he is going to have a good position at the uh, bank. And here Mrs. Linde says, uh, Nora offering to do all this for me, particularly in your case, it's, it's very kind of you, uh, where you haven't known much trouble or hardship in your life. So we can see that even Christine seems to hold uh, the same opinion like Torvald. And Nora here uh, says that, uh, what, and Mrs. Linda also says, what a child you are, Nora. So even we can find that just like Torvald, even Christine Linde fails to treat Nora, uh, you know, or to look, up, to look upon her uh, seriously as an individual and here Nora says that you are just like the rest of them. You all think I am useless when it comes to anything really serious. So uh, this is made clear by uh, Nora that uh, it's not just Torvald but you too Christine that whenever it is about you know whenever we are talk when whenever anything serious is talked about any serious matter all of you think that I am good at nothing. I am completely a useless individual. You people never take me seriously. And you feel that I never had to struggle much in, her, in my life. And here Nora refers to her big secret. And Mrs. Linde says that uh, you have only just been telling me all the things you have had to put up with. You, you only told me what were the things that you had to, you know, uh, adjust yourself with. So Nora says, yes, they were just petty things, trivialities that I just mentioned, but I had to face, a, I had to face something very, very serious uh, or let's say a very hard, you know, uh, struggle in my, difficult struggle in my life. I haven't told you about the really big things. So here for the first time, Nora refers to her, you know, big Secret which is uh, just not a secret for her, but which is indeed a matter of joy and pride for her. And Nora says that I'm going to tell you something, Christine. I too have something to be proud and happy about. This is important again because so, so long uh, Mrs. Christine has been projecting herself as a sacrificing woman and even she took pride in the fact that she did sacrifice her own happiness for the sake of her family, for the sake of her younger brothers, for the sake of her uh, sick uh, mother. So Nora says that just like you Christine, even I have something as well to feel proud of which is not just a matter of pride for me but a matter of joy. Uh, as well it is a matter of joy uh, as well uh, for Nora and this is something which she has not disclosed to anyone and for the first time in the play 
uh, we come to know from her that uh, she is the one who actually uh, saved Torvald's life. And so she says, uh, I was the one who saved Torvald's life. So now uh, we shall see in our next in in our next uh, uh, lecture uh, what Nora is going to what secret Nora is going to uh, reveal to Christine Linde. So in my next lecture uh, I shall continue uh, analyzing Act One of Henry Ibsen's famous play A Doll's House. So if you have like the lecture if you have been able to understand my explanation do like share and subscribe to my channel until then bye bye